Well, I'm here because I was invited uh, for, my, for my work all these years. I'm very happy about that. Yeah, as journalists, they carry the torch. They continue to write about us. So it's extremely important. My name is Wilder Jenkins, and I'm here at the Jazz Journalist Award because, for one, I'm a nominee, and I think this award is very important because it's one of the few opportunities to recognize the great artistry in this music, and not only the established master-level musicians, but also some of the developing musicians as well. And it's also a great opportunity to recognize what I guess you could refer to as the support system for this music. And that would be uh, journalists, radio, uh, presenters, photographers, and all those people who toil out of sheer love for this music. Because believe me, there's not a whole lot of money to be made in that system, but we all love this music, and that's why we're here. I was not alone in starting it. There was a uh, feeling in the... Uh 1980s that we had a lot of uh, issues in common and that it would be good to network amongst the people who were writing about music, writing about jazz, photographing it, um, broadcasting it. And we wanted to see if we could get together both on a social basis and a professional basis and keep our eyes on what was going on in journalism and uh, have a service organization for those of us who are working in that field. Jazz Award started in 1996, and that came about uh, through Michael Dorff's um, initiative, actually. He had proposed that we have a uh, 
Awards program. He actually proposed it to uh, Gene Santoro. And Gene found that it was uh, not something that he could devote time to. But uh, the JJ thought, yes, this is appropriate for us. This is what jazz journalists traditionally do, uh, participate in polls and do things to try to raise the presence of uh, musicians in general and acknowledge excellence. So we took it on. Oh, gosh, it's been everybody from the uh, people who started the uh, Jazz Foundation of America to uh, saxophone um, repairmen, uh, well-known in uh, Boston, uh, many educators, uh, community uh, activists who supported jazz. Uh, we used to call this the uh, JJA's A-Team, or Activists, Advocates, Altruists, Aiders and Abettors of Jazz. That, at that point, we were um, conferring these awards uh, on the basis of a committee of JJA members deciding who deserved them. And then we uh, decided to uh, consult with local activists in communities all over the country and urge them to uh, celebrate their heroes. We try to do it as a way for local communities to have something that they can participate in during uh, Jazz Appreciation Month and use media, learn how to use their media connections locally. Well, it started as the A-Team originally, um, for the Aiders and the Abettors, and it morphed into Jazz Heroes in 2009? I think it? that's right, yes. We started with the A-Team in 2001, and the first people who were um, hailed as Aiders of Betters, act, eh, what is it? Advocates, <laughs> activists, <laughs> altruists, Aiders and Abettors of Jazz were um, uh, her, uh, and Herb Stouffer and uh, Dr. Billy Taylor, who had begun the uh, Jazz Foundation of America. And then for several years, we did this uh, nominating, nominating within committee. And then we thought, really, we should turn this into the communities and see what kind of nominations of heroes we get from localities all over. And that was in part to uh, piggyback on Jazz Appreciation Month and thinking um, Jazz Appreciation Month does some fantastic things within the federal government and between the agencies of the government and also outside the country, but they weren't doing much programming here within the United States where we have these people who are going unrecognized and they're not necessarily musicians, although they, many of them are. Uh, everybody's serving the music in one way or another. And uh, we just wanted to thank uh, those people and try to bring them to the attention of their communities. We thought it would be a good way for um, uh, press to uh, uh, cohere around people who are not musicians. So they weren't gonna get reviewed, but they were gonna get talked about as people in the community, human interest stories, if you will. Well, I think it's great. I, and I'm just one quick question here. Why only the US, Howard? Why not other cities as well? What other countries as well? For a while we were doing it in Canada also. But, um, you know, really, we have been working to improve the uh, international outreach of the JJA, but the, um, it makes a difference when people are overseas and getting uh, projects really completed has proved to be challenging. Also, the mails are very expensive. So when we are sending out um, statuettes, the mail to... Uh, someplace overseas is almost as much as the manufacturer of the statuette and it, it really doesn't make much sense but also it's just that I'm, we're not in the communities there with as much presence and so it's difficult to uh, go to france or germany or japan uh, uh australia now we have contacts the jj has contacts all over there now and we've been publishing uh reports from uh international reporters about uh jazz rebounding Jazz Under Lockdown and Jazz Rebound. You can see all those at jjnews.org. So we're continuing that, but it's just, you know, early on in the JJA, we had a, a, a chapter in Moscow and it was very difficult to, to work with them. I mean, we like them, they liked us, but they eventually said, we could do this ourselves. We don't need to be part of a US organization or an international organization. 
So there is a Moscow JJA run by Cyril Moshkow, who's the editor of Jazz RU, a very fine, very fine website. Um, and we are in communication, but uh, it's not an official thing. Okay, one final question, and then I'm going to turn it over to Howard. Susan, uh, in terms of working uh, on the Jazz Heroes program, what's been the, the most gratifying part of it for you? Is the discovery that there is jazz in absolutely every corner of our country. And you know, we did have a jazz hero in New Zealand. Um, we had tried to go international, but it, 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 it becomes unwieldy. But for me, it's been reaching out into the different communities and, and discovering what folks are doing to keep their scene vibrant. There, there's jazz in West Virginia, there's jazz in Montana, there's jazz everywhere and people are really coming together in, in, to create this community. And um, it's very exciting for me. Absolutely. Okay, since I'm a jazz hero, I'm just gonna step back here and I'm gonna turn this over to Howard, who's going to uh, uh, moderate this uh, wonderful group of people and our viewers on YouTube and Facebook. If you have questions, uh, I will pass them on to Howard, and he will decide whether or not to, uh, to utilize them. So take it away, Howard. Okay, well, I will try. Thanks again, everybody, for being here. And the way we've got this set up is we'll have small discussion groups uh, of uh, four or five heroes, and then we'll move on to another discussion group and another discussion group. So um, the first gang of uh, heroes that we're going <coughs> to gather here is uh, Nancy Aschenschlager from New Orleans, Sus Sue Ross from Atlanta, uh, Norman Vickers from Pensacola. Norman, are you here? Yes, yeah, so I'm here. here. I see you. I see you. Yes, I'm here. And uh, Greg Gregory Bell from Rochester. And I was going to ask simply, how has uh, jazz activism been for you and jazz engagement uh, during the last year, during the pandemic year, 2020? So Nancy, why don't you talk about what you've, how you've been dealing with the, with the, uh, the year as it was. Unmute, unmute, unmute. Susan, you unmute too. Sorry. That's okay, Greg, you're unmuted. <laughs> um, I, well, I've been home staying since last March, but gradually getting out and, and definitely this whole time, support wise, uh, there's been a whole lot online. Um, the, the Jazz and Heritage Foundation has been sponsoring and helping a lot of musicians and, um, and also their students in their school. The, uh, our museum, which harbors the Jazz Museum, has been doing almost every week concerts um, now they're, they've been doing them outside where people can be on a lawn, but they're all, they've been, um, they've been filming them all for everybody and they've been supporting a lot of musicians. So I, I think a lot of our, uh, our organizations, um, as, as, as well as the Jazz and Heritage Foundation um, and, and the Preservation Hall Foundation have been supporting jazz ongoing virtually. And the community has been supporting. A musician's clinic has been amazing with all kinds of support. Uh, this crew of red beans that we have here has been uh, doing fundraising for, and a lot of meals for musicians and uh, you know the arts in need. So it's been very heartwarming. And then individuals have been doing their own Zooms uh, and virtually they've been using tip jars. And I think our community has really supported that a lot. There are some that have been going for a year. Don Vappi's been on every day for a year. You know, my friend Anissa, jazz vocalist, is every Saturday. And, you know, it's, it's, it's been very supportive of the community, as well as the Jazz Foundation, which has really, via the jazz musician, done lots and lots of concerts virtually for musicians. Well, I want to know about what you personally have done, but first I'm going to ask, I'll get back to that. Let's ask Sue uh, what she's been up to in the last past year. 
Well, I've been, you know, as you know, I'm a photographer, so I've sh been sharing a lot of my old jazz uh, photos uh, uh, on social media, on Facebook and Twitter and and uh, Instagram. So that's that's been one way of kind of revisiting where jazz was. Of course, everything you know is virtual. We're doing a lot of uh, concert, a lot of concerts virtually with folks. Uh, and um, the, I'm also on the board of the Atlanta Jazz Festival. And we, of course, had to postpone last year because of the pandemic. And we, will be, we plan to be coming back shortly uh, with, the, the group, with all the groups that were scheduled to perform last year. Uh, and, um, but it's been, it's been an interesting year. This has been the year of Zoom and, and uh, social media for, for interacting with folks in the jazz field. Norman, have you also been inundated with Zoom activities? Oh, mute, unmute, unmute, unmute. Just did it, I thought. Yeah, 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 okay, okay now. Now. there you go. Okay, now. now, okay, now, all right. Uh, we've uh, done a lot of uh, email stuff. We uh, do a newsletter once a month. Uh, we uh, have had some uh, events already and next month we're going to do an outdoor two-day jazz festival we missed last year of course but uh we're starting a two-day jazz festival so uh email and uh newsletters um, a number of you get these newsletters i hope and uh, so that's what we're doing and we're gradually getting back to uh normal activity thank you greg, thank you greg what's been the situation in rochester uh, well, uh, I used to do a weekly post of all the quite a few live jazz gigs and restaurants and clubs around Rochester, and um, that stopped completely, of course, in March of last year. But uh, I continued to share. Uh, there were some artists that, uh, and groups that were doing uh, um, streams. Uh, local record store, The Bob Shop, had a uh, started a front row at The Bob Shop, which was a stream. Um, where they would bring in artists from out, outside of uh, Rochester, which they did before. Um, and they uh, um, uh, they bring in some of the, you know, like tonight, it's going to be John Irvigan, sax Um And uh, so they bring in some people from outside that are, and who are a little bit on the outside. Um, but I shared that through, uh, um, once the shutdown and the, the blog wasn't getting as much traffic, so I... I flipped to my Twitter and Facebook channels to try to um, share those uh, more widely um, since anybody could watch them. Um, in the fall, things started to change a little bit. We started to get a few, there were some unique venues that could bring people in because uh, they were large enough uh, and they decided to try. Um, and those, uh, you know, so I started to get a few gigs coming in. So I started to mix those. I made a pandemic edition post that I keep at the top of the site. And I just keep updating it as I hear about things. Uh, don't always hear about everything, but, and people sometimes cancel things and never tell me about them, but that's just the way. And I, I tell them to call first. Um, joined a number of live streams myself. Uh, Spent some money <laughs> supporting jazz, jazz, uh, j j the Jazz Foundation of America and some of the fundraisers they did. Uh, you know, and again, shared those types of things. When I came across them, I would share them through a, my Twitter and Facebook feed. Okay, we're going to do just one uh, real quick uh, round through again. Uh, uh, Nancy, has jazz helped you in the last year or have you helped jazz more? Oh, absolutely. Jazz and music. Um, we've had an outdoor venue and I have been there as much as I can. Uh, I haven't outreached as much in helping the community because I'm 81 and it was just recently that I felt uh, comfortable being out more. But I, I've been, I, I say I'm a connector in New Orleans and, you know, I so, know so many musicians, jazz and otherwise, that have been trying to outreach virtually. And I've really been trying to, in, to pass that on and support all of that. Um, WWOZ has been amazing. I support them. They're actually going to broadcast the whole Jazz Fest again virtually. 
And then come October, when we're really going to have a jazz fest, then I'll be involved. Okay. Sue, the same question of you help jazz or has jazz helped you? Oh, I think both. I think both. You know, I've, I've been able to share a lot of, of photographs from the last 40 years uh, uh, with other people, but also I've, I've um, jazz has helped me get through the pandemic. And then of course, we are we're doing a series on our on the Atlanta Jazz Festival website at uh, atlantafestivals.com of interviews with all of the people who will be playing at our next jazz festival. And um, so that comes on every Tuesday night at 730. And that those interviews help us get through. the music just brings us, you know. Norman, um, unmute again. OK, and so. Uh, the, the, the Jazz Pensacola organization, was it able to really co uh, cohere, stay together during this time? Uh, we, yes, we, uh, we have, have had some uh, meetings uh, and uh, like I say, we're starting our jazz festival uh, next month, uh, a two, two day outdoor jazz festival. So, uh, yeah, and we've kept together with newsletters and email. And Greg, also, the community there has been able to stay connected? Uh, there's, yeah, there's a bunch of jazz communities here. And I've heard about some of them that have been staying connected virtually. Uh, um, we, uh, you know, a lot of them go in through Jazz 90.1, our local jazz station. Uh, um, I've got, you know, a number of people have contacted me, but, you know, asking about things. Uh, I kind of feel like a little bit of an imposter syndrome because I, I really, I'm amongst these great people that have done so much. Um, but I think it's done more for me because it kept my mind focused on things other than the, the pandemic. And I, think I just did what I could, you know, outside of my, you know, I got a day job and that's where I'm focusing a lot of my time and trying to, uh, but it, it was really nice to have something that I could focus on and try to do what I could. And now, you know, as things start opening up, I've got more focus because I want to really start rebuilding and, you know, and building and rebuilding the community, reintroducing people to the local artists. Thank you. That's a great thing. I would say it's been soul saving. Good. Soul enriching and soul saving. That's that's great. And it's a good segue into the next group of people that we're going to talk to. So if you folks will mute and Louise Rogers and uh, Henry, Henry Wong, Louise Rogers from Washington Heights, Henry Wong from Baltimore, uh, Aaron Myers from uh, the Capitol uh, Hill Jazz Foundation in Washington, D.C., soon to be our 51st state, I hope. And uh, let's see, Jose Masso uh, from Boston. Uh, you know, I want to hear you guys talk about how you've sustained programs and what kind of adaptations you've had to make, if any. Um, and we can have a little like feeling of, of talking amongst ourselves and, you know, not just one to me, you know, but anyway, try it. Um, Louise, why don't you start off? Okay. Um, well, we kind of adapted immediately. We, uh, we had had a jazz jam that had been happening for five years. Every Wednesday, we had just celebrated the fifth, the fifth year of it. And we had just celebrated the, um, third annual Washington Heights Jazz Festival. So we we just kind of adapted immediately in about, uh, we just started the, immediately started a jazz salon online. So it wasn't a jazz jam as much as it was a jazz salon. So we went from there and, and everyone showed up and it was wonderful. What um, is a salon, talking well, or playing? What, what we said was come and share, come and share with us. You know, and the first week was everybody was just kind of trying to figure out what on earth is going on here and where do we go from here. So, um, yeah, people came and they shared. Most people played music. And at that time, nobody knew what Zoom, we were, we were just trying to figure it out. So I think 
you know, just for kicks, I think we, we decided, oh, yeah, let's all try and play Now's the Time. Get your instrument out. And it was like the funniest thing ever because, every, you know, the timing is just, we recorded it because it was just hilarious. Just And people were just downright cracking up and laughing. Um, so, but, you know, people were talking about what's going to happen. So it was important, that first meeting. And then from 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 then, it just became people came and, and they shared. Um, they sang. And then people got used to I Reel. You know, people got more, they got more and more used to what the new, the new norm was. Um, so we did the jazz salon immediately. And then from there we went to, we had a monthly vocal series that had been going on for over three years. So we, we continued that. And we did self-contained, we, we went with self-contained groups for the vocal series. So we had Terry Roiger and John Menegon were the first ones. And again, we didn't know what we were doing with Zoom. We didn't know people had to mute. We didn't know, so the sound was crazy. But you know, we just we just felt like we had to keep going and sus try to sustain what we had been building um, as Whoops. much as we could. Henry just walked away, and I was going to ask him to follow up on that. So, oh. um, <laughs> so um, uh, do, 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 do. let's well, go we, to home. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, we we also had a, a few other things. There was a um, there was an Indian restaurant here in Washington Heights that had started having jazz, and they did that for three years, and then they they couldn't continue it. So Jazz Wah High picked up, and you know we started doing the online jazz every Friday night for the Indian restaurant. We just tried to keep things going as much as we could to try to keep people inspired. <laughs> Jose, what about you? You address a very uh, distinct. Uh listenership in uh, in Boston. Without live music, uh, are we able to keep the, the enthusiasm going? I can, but you know what? Uh, if you don't mind, I know that Aaron has time-sensitive issues. Do you sure. mind if bounce to Aaron? That way we give him enough time and then you can come back to me. Aaron, is that all right with you? Of course. Of course. <laughs> I'm sorry, Aaron. Go ahead. Um, well, f first of all, just thank you and thank you to each and every one of you who are continue to do the work. Uh, and we do the work because we love it. And when you're talking about sustaining, um, it's a very interesting thing in Washington, DC, um, I think between Herb Scott and myself, and you hear Herb in, a, in uh, one of the next groups, he uh, founded and is the executive director of the Capitol Jazz Foundation, and I chair the board of directors. And we looked at sustaining and sustainability from two sectors looking at what you currently had going on, but also understanding and looking in the future, what do we need to do now to make sure that we'd be able to do anything a year from now, six months from now? Uh, immediately, Herb and I, in talking, Herb realized that, you know what, we're going to, uh, people are going to need relief, and this is going to last for a while. Uh, our organization was the first organization in Washington, D.C. to offer micro grants out to uh, about 80 musicians. Uh, we started doing fundraising immediately so that we could keep going with uh, keep going with some of the things like the Jazz Jam that we had as well here that Herb started. Uh, they moved that, of course, online, and then we were able to convince and uh, give some restaurants a model of what they could do to keep in touch with their customer bases through music, you know, and to do it safely. Washington had a very strict hold on not meeting up and doing uh, in-person events whatsoever. So uh, during that time, what we did, we coalesced all of the jazz community and we called them at first jazz stakeholders, what evolved to be DMU, DMV music stakeholders, nonprofits, uh, for-profit organizations, venues, festival owners, and then musicians. We came together and we come together still today twice weekly to share information, to share resources, to learn from each other, uh, to help point each other in the direction in which we should go as far as advocacy for the relief that we needed to sustain anything. And I think everybody here understands to sustain anything. We knew that musicians need to be able to have a way to eat, have housing security, not insecurity, uh, have some money in, the, in their pockets and venues needed a way to stay open. We began to craft legislation immediately so that we could figure out how we could do accomplish those two things. And the next big lift we're gonna address this uh, coming Thursday is gonna be the lift of seeing if we can have a, a minimum basic income for musicians uh, in this city. And I think that we all should adopt uh, that in our own advocacy because uh, starving artists is a misnomer. That is a misnomer, that's a fake 
that's fake. It, it's a shirking of responsibilities from uh, uh, our district and our uh, municipal governments. Many of us know who are advocates here that uh, we wanted to sustain so much, but when you do not have a priority of music in schools where you have uh, teachers who don't have instruments or access to this, that, and the third. Well, how can we expect them to prioritize it when it comes to unemployment or to business or infrastructure and things of that nature? Herb and I have worked extremely hard to ensure that the legislation is in place and that we've seen models where these things can actually work. And so, uh, and lastly, I said the last thing we've been trying to sustain is the Congressional Jazz Caucus that I hope all of you will write your Congress people and ask them to join the Congressional Jazz Caucus. Currently, we're looking for a Republican co-leader because our Republicans left Congress and with Congress being close to the public, we can't do in-person lobbying to go and ask and advocate for members to join the caucus. And uh, But Sheila Jackson did reintroduce the legislation that Herb will be speaking about a little bit later uh, so that uh, a version of H.R. 57 with teeth on it could actually possibly get past this coming uh, this uh, upcoming Congress. So um, we're working hard and we did a lot it of hard work like, this during this time. It sounds like you're working hard. Are you sharing some of these projects with um, some of your uh, peer, peer organizations, you know, in other locales? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. What we've been what and getting uh, getting together and I, I encourage all of you to try to do this. Getting together, get a, getting together the DMV music stakeholders, we took, I mean, executive directors and club owners and musicians from all over the, the district, Maryland and Virginia. And we began to see what they were doing. What we noticed is that people were searching for solutions in silos, individually, trying to figure this thing out as if they were the only ones dealing with these problems. It gives a great boost of confidence to know that you're not stupid. You're not the only one who can't figure these forms out or you're not the only one who's behind on rent. You're not the only one who is not sure if they can get their instrument uh, repaired. Um, you're not the only one who is trying to figure out how to stream appropriately. Uh, your age is not a barrier. So you don't have to be left out because of ageism. So coming together like this made these lifts so much easier and reachable and doable. And it helped to know what other people were doing because when we got certain bits of information, we could pass them on to people we knew who would value this. Likewise, we were get inundated with information that helped us add value to our organization. Herb has been able to maintain a lot of our programs that we've been doing uh, throughout the year only because we've been sharing information, sharing the load, sharing the lift, and understanding that we are in this together. That's and I, I think this is what I've learned more so. Sustainability means that we have got to be in this together. This is how jazz has survived, us working hand in hand, Jazz is the first genre of music to reach out and say, we will only play in front of integrated audiences or we'll have an integrated bandstand. Or women were early early on in jazz with the people who were providing a lot of the music that we, uh, that we enjoy today. Jazz can still do this. We can still come out of this thing stronger. But I think right now sustainability means that we are working together. And that's what we tried to do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, good, good, good words and good thoughts. Henry, uh, let me wake you up there. Um, and un <laughs> I, I know that you've had uh, sustainability on your mind since the beginning too, although I'm afraid that maybe in the, in the way that um, uh, Aaron was talking about it, you've been a little bit of a silo. I think that that's out of necessity. Maybe there aren't a lot of people to work with in Baltimore this way, but you've done a great job on sustaining the Andai Music programs. Talk about how you decided to do that, please. Uh, thank you, Howard. Thank you for inviting and hello to everyone. I'm a newcomer in this jazz community, but we, Andy Music has been presenting jazz for uh, since 2002 and we have done over 4,600 concerts. Uh, we immediately, like Louise did, um, we work, jump onto the whole thing during the pandemic beginning of the shelter at home. Uh, with our governor passed the law that nobody can go out unless you're essential workers. Uh, so what we want to do is continuously to achieve our goal to support our local musicians in Baltimore and give them a chance the opportunity to keep performing and make a living and also keeping our programming uh, alive. So we actually wrote a letter to the governor of Maryland to ask for approval to change our concert venue to a broadcasting center. 
And by doing that, we are allowed to be considered as an essential uh, um, place. So we so we can continuously to program our jazz shows. So we started with once a week with like three musicians, social distancing. And um, we actually grow as we learn how to do all this stuff. We, we were able to hire some Peabody Conservatory graduate sound engineering student to assist us during the whole program. And um, so we buy equipments, you know, along the way by saving the money from the ticket sales that we have, uh, uh, we make. And we were able to also ask for donations to support the musicians. So, um, so we have done over 240 shows since March 20th of last year. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, and talk about the audience that you've been able to reach that way. Well, since it's live streaming is so new for us, so we have to figure out a way to make people pay uh, to, to watch the show because since everything was available free on Facebook and on YouTube, so we, we decided that we're going to make a difference, that we're going to start charging people a minimal of $5 ticket fee and asking them to make donations. Uh, so we are quite successful in that area. We, we have a lot of donations and a lot of repeat donations. So as time goes on, we increase our ticket prices from $5 to seven, and now it's 10. And then we also have been adding to $15. And, you know, the response is pretty good. The musicians, you know, they do get paid. Uh, majority of the ticket sales goes to them. And, you know, in a way that some think more, they actually have a regular jazz club. So I, I think the publicity promotion is, a, is essential. And you have to continuously reminding the public that there is a concert going on. And we also make our uh, accessibility a lot easier by, by allowing ticket sales to continue during the concert. So people can continuous buy tickets anytime during the concert and afterwards, so they can still tune in. And we also allow the link to, to, to last for one week. Most of the venues, they usually do it for one day, two days or three days. So we keep it longer. So to make sure that people can always have the ability to watch their favorite musicians to perform. So by doing that, we actually sell quite a few tickets after the concert has ended. So those are the things that we learn and we we go along with it. And we also able to help other ven uh, venues. They asked me about how to set it up. So we always try to share with all our success stories and the failures. <laughs> so it, it's, a, it's a growing, it's a learning curve for Andy Music. Uh, but we, we are glad that we're able to sustain and we are glad that we can help the musician to sustain so they can earn some uh, a, a, a small income during this pandemic. Well, that, that issue about, um, you know, actually making this sustainable by charging uh, for live streaming and this sort of thing is a very key uh, uh, issue. And I think uh, some of the other people will be talking about that as we go on. Thank you, Henry. And Thank now, you. Jose, let me, let me get back to you. So you haven't had a venue except you've got the airwaves. Huh? I do. Sustaining and, 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 stuff. Thank you, Howard. And first, let me start off by thanking you again and Brett for making this possible. I am honored to be part of this august group of heroes. It's really humbling to see so many great people in one place at right time. Um, so 2020 was a disruptive year for all of us. Uh, the last time I stepped into the radio station at WBUR was March 13th of last year. This is coming June 22nd. God willing, if I'm healthy, I'll be celebrating my 46th anniversary of being on the air on National Public Radio at WBUR. But that being said, I quickly learned that if I was going to continue to do programming, at least on the air, I would have to do it from my home. So I purchased all the equipment that I would need. If, you, if I flip this over here, you see the microphone that I use, and all my equipment is right in front of me, and you see my record collection, the vinyl, and then in another room in my office, I have all my CDs, so I'm able to basically program my music right from here. And I just stop by the station once a week and drop off an SD card and they program it in the computer and it goes on the air every Saturday night. But at the same time, thanks to my son, who's of the younger generation, 
I realized that I can go live on Facebook and YouTube. So since last March 22nd, I started broadcasting both on Facebook and YouTube Saturday and Sunday afternoons from four to six. And what this did for me, Howard, is that allowed me to share some music, but also to bring in a new audience, a broader audience that included Latin America and some in Europe and other places here in the United States. And also to bring musicians on as guests because sure enough, musicians have a lot of time in their hands and therefore they were more accessible and willing to be on the air as guests. So I've had 105 programs of which I've had guests just about every single Saturday and Sunday. And not only have we had musicians, we've had topics such as, you know, Dr. Chris Washburn's latest book, Latin Jazz, The Other Jazz, where we had a round table discussion on two different sessions. I invited Bobby Sanabria, musician and educator who has a show on WBGO, uh, Ray Vega, musician, educator who has a show in Vermont, um, Sammy Figueroa, who's also another musician and has a program in, uh, on WKDN, uh, in, NDA in, um, in Miami, Arturo Gomez from uh, Colorado, and we had a conversation for two hours about jazz, Latin jazz, and the issues with regards to that. And I had other musicians and artists who have joined me to talk about a number of things. But most importantly, I think, piggybacking on the two conversations you just had, was I think we have found that if anything, 2020 for me and others has made us aware of is how important this ecosystem that we are part of has to be in place in order to support each other, both musicians, programmers, producers, uh, those of us who do programming on radio, those who do programming with concerts and things of that nature, this ecosystem is broader than just a silo of musicians and music it has to include people from the public sector, has to include people from philanthropy and the nonprofits, has to include people from the private sector to be of help so we can continue to sustain each other and start looking at what the paradigm might look like moving forward because it's not going to be what it was in the past. And then last, what I'll say to you is I think 2020, the disruptions were not just the pandemic. It was the issues having to do with social justice and those issues and therefore in the forefront make it possible for us to really address what social justice looks like and what role music plays in this conversation. At the end of the day, my thinking is, and I hope some of you agree, is that musicians are angels, living angels amongst us, and it's through their music that we are able to live our lives in a way that takes care of all of those stress, all those challenges that we have been confronting. The musicians are the ones that bring us light. The musicians are the ones who have been given this talent and this gift that only they have been able to receive from God. And therefore, that gift has made it possible for us to sustain ourselves emotionally, physically, intellectually, spiritually through these last 12, 13, 14 months. And for that, we have to acknowledge the role that music and musicians play in our lives and therefore support them as being as important, if you will, as any other person who is providing any kind of quality of life for us, if not more important. And so I think these last 13 months have given us that opportunity to gather and really take a moment to reflect as to the role of music and musicians in our lives. Well said, Jose. You you must be used to talking on the radio or something very, uh, <laughs> uh, but thank you. I mean, I think that this point about the ecosystem and how we all really are dependent upon each other is the thing that um, uh, we can focus on in this next group of, of people talking and how we're looking ahead. I mean, it seems like what from people saying that actually uh, the challenges gave us more energy and, uh, you know, uh, uh, sp uh, spontaneous uh, improvisation about how we do our things and some really good things have come out of it. So um, Jose is uh, from Boston, by the way, and Aaron Myers, who talked earlier, is from Washington, D.C. And um, I see Herb Scott is on his partner. We'll talk to him in a little bit. And um, uh, Louise Rogers is from uh, Washington Heights, which is in Manhattan, uh, New York City. And uh, da, 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 da. see, I'm having spin here. Aaron, Jose, Louise, and then we talk to, uh, gosh, I'm losing it. Henry. Henry, Henry Wong Henry. from Baltimore. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I can't see everybody on because I've got the chat open too. So it's over people's faces. Anyway, let's move on and have another group. So Marguerite Horberg from Chicago from Hot House Global. Uh, Philip Byther from The Walker in Minneapolis. Uh, Greer uh, Smith 
from uh, Poughkeepsie uh, Trans Arts uh, in the Hudson River Valley. And um, let's see, who was our other person here? Uh, I've also had my- Gail. Gail, I'm sorry, Gail Boyd, of course. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about um, uh, how, how you've seen things going forward. What kind of changes you've perceived uh, along the lines of what we were just talking about, this ecosystem and the, the interactivity, and also the attention to the social justice issues. Have those made a difference? How have they made a difference? How are we going to be presenting music going forward? Please, uh, Marguerite, do you begin? <laughs> Thanks, thank you, and thanks for the award. It's great to meet everybody and listen to everybody's work. Um, kind of picking, picking up where Jose left off, you know, our focus has been at the intersection of social justice and, and music for a very long time. And not only are we confronted by the pandemic and the legacy and hangover of Trump, but in Chicago uh, today, we're also uh, mourning the, the death of Adam Toledo, a 13-year-old young, uh, young boy. Um, so, you know, the, the work that we try to do is to connect activism and the communities that are fighting around different, different issues with, um, at the same time, creating a platform for the artists to uh, vocalize and, and give expression to their to their work. And so some of the highlights that we've, uh, we created a, a new um, streaming platform last year, Hot House Global. And the first uh, set of programs we did were really repudiating the myth that Trump was rolling out at the time about the Asian uh, pandemic uh, connections. And so we, we created a series of Asian uh, improvised music concerts that Tatsu Aoki uh, organized that had artists from uh, Taiwan and Seoul, Korea and live from Japan. And so that was kind of the first set of things that we did. And because we're also very interested in ending <laughs> the blockade of Cuba, we got very involved with the Cuban uh, Minister of Culture and the Cuban Minister of Music. And we were able to create a pretty phenomenal concert last July, the Concert for Cuba, which called for the end of the blockade and to recognize the Cuban medical doctors. And in December, uh, Hot House in Chicago created a platform that connected to the Havana Jazz Festival. And so we were able to kind of trade fours with four ensembles um, coming out of Cuba with uh, Chicago improvised musicians that have been long affiliated with the AACM. So, um, you know, that's, you know, the success, I think other people have talked about this, but, uh, you know, really, I think it's the, the benefits, the pluses have been to work internationally. That's, to me, the biggest the biggest boon is to to have voices that uh, aren't per physically traveling, but can you know um, have their their expression uh, remotely. And um, we're committed to doing this long long term. So all the presenters we've talked to around the country, and all the other folks kind of see a hybrid model uh, lasting for forever, basically. And and even live presenters will probably have some component of a virtual um, broadcasting. So we're trying to um, technically improve, uh, learn more tricks, because I think, you know, as, as presenters, you have to kind of up your game. And, um, and so we're interested in the telemetric part of it. And uh, anyway, that's well, let me good what we're that's, doing. That's great. But let, let's move over to Philip then, because I, Phil, I, I don't think you've been doing any uh, 
live streaming. Have you from the Walker? Um, we just, we chose early on not to live stream, but instead to create digital productions. Um, and it's mostly been in the realm of contemporary dance and poetry and, and theater. Um, but what we did do um, as soon as the pandemic hit is we finished the work as on the museum side of what the Walker is as a contemporary art center of delving into our archives and creating an online publication called Creative Black Music Selections from the Walker's Archives, which we dug out these incredible troves of material, video um, and audio, um, things that had never seen the light of day from Anthony Braxton to Cecil Taylor to Ornette Coleman to, to um, a whole host of artists and commissioned new essays from younger, uh, younger um, um, jazz artists and paid people to reflect and write about um, this era uh, of music. But also at the same time, we committed to a couple of additional commissions, uh, artists that we knew needed time to make things um, that they could do on their own, uh, that we would show when we could get back to live performance. So we did a large uh, commission with Cecile McLaurin Salvant because she wanted to focus on her visual art side of things and she could do it during the pandemic. Um, we also, um, as an institution, took a chunk, a small, uh, but pretty okay chunk of the acquisition budget at the Walker for, for new art and redirected it to 10 local smaller organizations to, re to give grants to artists in the Twin Cities. Um, a handful were musicians just to sustain people um, and we didn't have to be the deciders on that. Um, and we're, uh, I was frustrated, of course, like all of us, about not being able to put on, bring audiences and artists together in real time. So we stayed committed to a couple of projects um, that we had planned, you know, the last year. And we just decided we're producing them outdoors for free. We're not going to worry about the revenue. So this summer, we're, we're starting a brand new avant jazz in the garden on the hillside that normally can hold 10,000 people, but carefully. Um, structured so 500 people get to see a whole generation of young, younger jazz artists. And we think it's important to sort of foreground to people um, the fact that jazz is a current, evolving, critical, vital form that's part of contemporary discourse and contemporary art, contemporary culture. And that's been a, a key part of my time at the Walker. Um, and we, we plan to do that um, forever. So I think we all applaud that, right? Um, yeah, we all like that. Um, <laughs> So Greer, your major public uh, programming, of course, is the Greer from Poughkeepsie in the Hudson Valley, uh, Hudson River Valley, is the festival, and that was suspended. What about the education programs and, and these sorts of things? How, how have you uh, sustained your ecosystem there? We chose to focus this, this time on keeping our audience. Um, and also making sure that the artists that have been good to us, uh, who always show up when we need them, made sure that they had uh, some revenue. So um, since school was out, um, we decided to do a digital production because they were, they're still working out the bugs and the lag time with all of these live streams and everybody is doing them. We're in a, a kind of a, a significant place because we're right outside of New York City, yet we're not in it. And so folks get exposed to a lot of stuff, but there's a huge portion of the community that is definitely underserved. We have bands and schools here that have no children of color in them. So we have a tremendous responsibility of bringing the folks that we bring here, bringing them consistently and um, showing that what this, this music is. I said to, um, to Gail the other day, when somebody says, Miss Smith, that's jazz. I didn't know that was jazz. I like that, that we know, we know we know what we're doing. Um, so what we chose to do is because we do get support from the endowment and, and NISCA and those folks, we decided to make sure that the artists got paid, worked with a, a venue that um, made us a deal that we couldn't uh, refuse. We had a full out six camera shoot um did did the remix and uh i divided the uh the four performances into 30 minute concerts and we've released we're starting to release them one at a time and they live and they'll live at least till uh memorial day 
on the website, but we're using that to keep the audience going. We, we have an ongoing di dialogue with the audience that way. And the, and the artists are, you know, no, we're not making any money, but they, but they were able to pay rent for a few months. So Gail Boyd, you're with alternative uh, uh, venues for jazz. And also uh, th that's really helped to bring some of these diverse uh, presenters and musicians and, and people from all through the industry together. And also the Jazz Coalition uh, turned very quickly to trying to do re-granting and, and raise funds for musicians. So what do you see going forward from all this though? And speaking to uh, what Greer has done to try to uh, keep the audience and those favored musicians engaged and what Philip's seeing uh, about keeping the music going that way and Marguerite talking about the social justice issues. I mean, is this, you know, inflating the uh, whole jazz uh, challenge, like for everybody who's involved, do we have to take all these things into account? How, how do you see that? I think we have to take all those things into account and even more. Um, but let me say that um, I want to thank you and Susan Brink for having me part of this body of people that I'm looking at. I am honored and I'm humbled. I can't think of something I would rather be called than a jazz hero. <laughs> jazz is my life. Um, and so you talked about two different initiatives. One, the Jazz Coalition, my two friends, Bryce Rosenblum and Danny Melnick, came to me and said that they wanted to raise money because it was at the, the height of the pandemic when everybody's contracts were being canceled and nobody was working. And they said, we know we can't support everybody, but we would like to at least let artists know that we're thinking about them. So we we raised $50,000 and gave $1,000 to 50 art, art jazz artists to commission them to write a work that would reflect their feelings about the pandemic. And they we we had a panel of jazz musicians select those that had been nominated and we gave that money away. Not too long after that, George Floyd was murdered and we came back together and said, we need to raise more money because we need to give money to people who can tell us their feelings about the social unrest and, and the racism that's going on. And so we raised quickly another $50,000 and we commissioned those artists. So. Um, I'm a child of the 60s, so I remember Alabama. I remember the Freedom Now Suite. I remember those kinds of things that kept people going during that time. And I wanted to make sure that, that artists today could reflect their feelings about it because much as Jose said, they are our voice. They really tell us how, how they're feeling, which sort of translates to how I'm feeling. So that was one of the things that we did. And now we have, we're, they're rolling in and we're going to have a hundred new commissioned pieces. And so our next role is to raise money and figure out what we're gonna do. The artists keep the copyrights because I am a manager and a lawyer. So I wanted to make sure that the artists were still protected, but we wanna showcase it in some kind of way. So uh, it may be albums, it may be digital releases, we don't know, but we do have, that's in our plans for the Jazz Coalition. Now, moving over to alternative venues for jazz. That was a Facebook page <clears throat> that I started in 2017. I was on my way to Jazz Connect to moderate a panel called Alternative Venues for Jazz. And while I was on the bus on my way to that panel, I called my son and asked him if he would create a Facebook page for me, primarily to keep in touch with the people who would be at that panel. That was really all it was going to be. But from, that, from 2017 until uh, last year, I had maybe 1,500 members on it. But as soon as the pandemic hit, and I used to tell musicians, I don't want you to post your jobs on this site. It's just for us to be a community. As soon as the pandemic hit, it dawned on me that my site was the ultimate alternative venue. So I, I wrote, reached out to everybody and said, post everything you want to post on here. If you're streaming from your bedroom, post it on here, whatever you want to do. And so people started doing that. 
And so then one day I put out a, a post and said, is there anybody who would like to do a little 30 minute talk and just tell me, I'm thinking of doing this maybe once a month, just tell me what's going on in your life. I got like 45 responses the same day. So I thought it'll be four years before I can do once a month. So why don't I do it daily? So tomorrow will be the one year anniversary of me having Monday through Friday, a jazz musician, a manager, someone in the industry, a, a, an author, anybody who has anything to do with jazz is welcome to come on. And I don't curate it. It can be somebody who is the top of the line star that we were calling in jazz all the way to somebody who just got out of school. But they come on and they spend their time. And I tell them, I want them to tell me the, all the answers that you wish people would ask you and they never did. So give me your life in the way you want to tell it. And it's been very, very interesting. So out of that, I then created alternative venues for jazz eavesdropping, which I just did last week, where we honored Randy Weston and we had four other pianists come on. And I told them, I want you to pretend that you're in the green room and like it's, it's 6,000 people just listening to you all talk in the green room to each other about Randy. And it was really a lot of fun. So if you all go to Facebook Alternative Venues for Jazz, you can see that. Um, but that's what I've been doing. But when you say, what are we going to do all that and more? We have to, I don't want to go back to normal. And I don't want to even fig figure out a new normal that's not going to pay artists more than they're getting now. That was the whole reason I started Alternative Venues for Jazz. And I want to make sure that if they're streaming, that they get paid, not point zero 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 two cents per stream but something that if they stream what jazz musicians stream which is less than pop less than country less than r b that we still can make a living on it so as a lawyer and as a manager that's how i want to move forward and i'm going to use this cohort that i see here to help me do that that'd be great and i hope that you'd also turn uh, that issue about getting paid to the journalists themselves. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, we are like not really part of that um, discussion all too often. Um, Absolutely. That would be great. Um, but, you know, I was also interested in this idea about uh, talking within the green room, like, and, you know, to your each other. And so let's use that as a segue to Jamal Dean and Wendell Harrison talking about um, this from the musician's point of view. Um, and, and how uh, you sustained your 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 fellow musicians during this time, and I think we can get um, well. Uh, let's juggle this around a little bit because I don't see Dwight Cribble here, and he was going to be part of this panel. So maybe Randy, you would join this discussion too, because you're very much within the uh, the musicians talking to musicians. That's something that I know sustains you too, and that that was part of Wendell. Your your impetus back in the 70s, so. The 70s. In that's, the where 70s. All, that's where it all started for me, in self-determination with uh, the tribe uh, organization. We had a magazine record company. But well, I'm honored to be here with the, I'm, I'm in good company today. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like a, a, this is like a, a comrade uh, uh, event, you know. Uh, yes. We all in the game together. And, uh, uh, I started out with tribe uh, self determination, and uh, we had musicians that invested in themselves, uh, producing. They had their own publishing, and uh, they had their own uh, managing uh, uh, team. And we uh, launched uh, a record company, and we also had a, a magazine called Tribe, which is uh, dealing with social economics and, and uh, political concepts, so political events that was happening uh, at, uh, in the 70s. And uh, it's, it's taken us, it's still alive today. Uh, uh, we just had a reissue of seven, seven uh, LPs that just came out uh, last month from the 70s. They were remastered and uh, they came out. And uh, uh, this pandemic, pandemic is something else in terms of, uh, it seemed like it's a, it's a new world. It's a new paradigm now. You know that we yeah. that we deal with you know and we uh, adjusting, but it's very encouraging to me you know because I can reach people uh, pretty easily now with this uh, new technology, and um, uh, what we've been doing lately uh, is, is dealing with uh, 
uh, streaming in the schools and whatnot, dealing with uh, uh, jazz education. I, I just did a, uh, a streaming this morning uh, dealing with uh, uh, discovering African rhythms in, in jazz. And we talk about uh, the rhythms that was they influenced jazz from West Africa, uh, Congo, as, as well as uh, Angola, Mozambique, you know, that was uh, transferred to uh, uh, Central America through the African uh, slave trade. You know, the queso beat, for instance, went into the uh, Calypso and, and, and uh, reggae, you know, which uh, uh, was a, a diaspora in the Caribbean, you know, African diaspora. Mm -hmm. in the but that, so this, the streaming in the schools uh, has been our forte since, since uh, the, the pandemic started, you know, getting uh, the necessary equipment and talking to the young people. The young people have got it together, you know. Next year I'll be eight, uh, 80, 80 years old. So, so uh, uh, it's like I'm on a new planet now. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, as, as what, and as, at the same time, I've been, uh, we've been doing a lot of licensing. You know, I uh, license a lot of this music from the archives of Tribe and Rebirth to uh, uh, companies in, in London and uh, Japan. Uh, mm -hmm. Japan just uh, licensed the Tribe magazine of 40 years. It's going wow. to be reissued in Japan. Wow. To, to, to Peabody. Peabody. <laughs> wow. You know, oh. and they, they really have an a interest in, in uh, 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 jazz and black music and black culture, you know, in Japan. And uh, uh, so we, I have about 10 companies that I license this music to, you know, uh, 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 three in the UK, uh, Belgium, uh, 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 Munich, Germany. You remember uh, uh, Inja Records in Germany. Uh, Are there younger members of the tribe coming on to you? Yes, I want to talk about this new. This briefly, new, briefly, we got to move. It's, it's new. <laughs> it's new. <laughs> it's Sorry, new, it's new uh, 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 interest. You know, uh, the ages is like from twenty to to thirty. Cool. You know? And uh, we're doing a lot of school projects at the beginning. We haven't been working live. They've been coming to my studio in, in writing and rehearsing and recording. And we get, we're doing a, my first event will be May, May 7th and 8th at a place called Crit, uh, Cliff Bells. Uh, uh, that's a club in downtown Detroit. Okay, great. Uh, also, we've uh, been streaming with the Afro-American Museum. They've been uh, 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 Recording us and, and uh, presenting us on the, uh, as, as well as Detroit Institute of Arts. In fact, the Detroit Institute, of Arts, I was able to pay, play with a group from Bosnia, dealing with jazz and and uh, a lot of interesting uh, uh, odd meters. In real time or uh, on virtually? Uh, real time, oh. you know, uh, but streaming, streaming, streaming. virtually. Amazing. This is going to like, this is going to Bosnia. It went to uh, uh, Paris and in, in, uh, Australia, as well as uh, well, to uh, DET radio, public radio. Well, know. well, we will have to look for this material. That yeah. sounds like great stuff. Um, uh, well, as a musician, I'm, 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 I feel pretty uh, comfortable, you know. Uh, I don't have to leave my home so much. <laughs> everything is right here. I don't have to leave. I, I, only, I have studio. I have everything here, and I'm just. I'm just need more technology. I need these young kids to come more. I'm inviting more young folks to come over and, and help help Granddad. You know that's great. <laughs> help Jam me out. Jamal Dean, you told me earlier that you this was like the first time you'd been able to be home, not on the road for a long time, right? But but uh, have you you kept in touch with every with your circle of musicians and you, you've been trying to uh, sustain that connections, those connections and their spirits, I would think. 
uh, yeah. But firstly, Howard, I'd like to thank you and the JJA for this um, this honor. And um, like I told you before, that if it wasn't for you guys, I wouldn't be who I am today. So, and it's, and it's really interesting as well, just to be in the company of all of these wonderful and great people who are doing all this magnificent work. Um, you know, it seemed like all the things that I've been involved with, uh, and it's like, you know, I was listening to everybody speak about how they uh, had been involved in what they were doing. But for me, it's been like all the years that I've been involved in this business that has led me to where I'm, I am now and able to be able to help all of the musicians in the area as well as the world um, in this particular moment. Um, yeah, I've been on the road since I'm 64 now and I've been on the road since I was 16. So the dynamic for me is a little different in terms of when the pandemic hit because I'm able to be home, you know, with family now, you know, cut the grass, you know, and help out with the plants and just, you know, to sit down for a moment, you know, because our bodies, we need that as well. And I've known lots of people who have, you know, passed on because they, they had been able to do that. So I think the creator to, you know, that I've been able, able to do that. But all the things that are led up, that has led up to this moment, um, producing this festival here in Philadelphia called the Outsiders Festival, I was able to, you know, I was able to connect with musicians who I was not able to connect with before because being international musicians, having to pay the fees for them to come to the States to be able to perform with me, being able to produce a broadcast made it much simpler and easier for me to do that. And I was able to connect with a lot of the musicians from different parts of the world. Um, and just to make the connection with them, still creating music that was improvised because I, I, we ran into this program called acapella and this was early on and the, these broadcasts that we did the first one that i did was with billy martin the drummer and with dave Fuzinski, the guitarist and this app allowed me to to create my part first to send it to them and they, they to do their part and we put it all together and at that moment, at those moments, I was able to, as a producer, form something that I was very happy and honored to present to people who were at home, who were not able to come out and see live concerts. You know, I was able to put together uh, uh, performances of musicians who weren't able to, uh, to come out themselves to be to perform. And doing that with them allowed me to be able to understand technology, uh, to be able to understand how to connect with um, forms of, of, of music that I was not able to do with before. Um, it's, it's a very interesting uh, world that we're living in right now. But, you know, the, I'm a product of the 80s, you know, being with Ornette Coleman, learning with Ornette how to be independent. Right now, it's, 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 it's allowing that knowledge has allowed me to be able to connect with the younger musicians explain to them how they can maneuver and navigate through this situation right now. Um, it's also a situation where you, one has to think about how they're going to put together their, their like we were talking about the eco situation, their, their economics, because the, the economics play a, a, a pretty big role in their survival. So I have conversations with the musicians. I stay in contact with them. I reach out to them, you know, making sure that they're still fine. Um, you know, workshops. I've been I've been invited to do workshops during this time, um, and in those workshops, I explain to the musicians how they can navigate through this time, through this period. So all of those things have been really good, and all the information that all of the other uh, honors honorees have been been able to express. I'm, I'm really happy to be able to hear that, and I hope we can all get together and, and work on something together at one at some point. Yeah. That might that might be really great. Let's see if we can make the JJ part of. Uh facilitating that. Randy, you, your, your um, studio, he Heavywood, right? Right. Uh, so you use this as a sort of a focal point, it seems like, for bringing people together and sustaining uh, the local musicians. So we talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah, I felt very fortunate to have the space, which I never knew this was all gonna, nobody knew this was all, all gonna happen, but it's a long building with numerous entry points where we could be in isolation booths and play 
with entrances and exits. I did some remodeling, we did some construction. So we have four separate ways to get in and out of these different rooms. And we have six def different ISO booths. So I just had to get the technology to do the video aspect if I wanted to um, stream it. But I already, as a studio, had the headphones and that other equipment. So I, I got a, a device called the Sling, um, Sling Box. It's, a, it's a, not the thing that you, uh, it's called the Sling Studio, I think. And, um, and so we got multi-cam and we do all that stuff and people feel comfortable. We're super careful about keeping the aerosols down and putting lots of um, space between sessions. And after setting this all up, I was contacted by three different schools, Portland State, um, Portland Community College, as well as Lewis and Clark where I teach. And I started streaming their senior recitals and, and um, also local professional concerts here. So I'm a place where people can actually play in real time without any latency, thank God. And, um, and it's been a, a great opportunity to let people play together who maybe hadn't played in months in some cases. You know, it's like I forgot what it was like to play with the ride symbol or, you know, in real time. So, um, so yeah, I got busy with that. My wife, turns out, is a good videographer and she's able to run around with the, or walk around with this camera and get live footage. And, you know, and I'm in this main room, so she's in my room and she goes, shoots through the window. And we do live streaming every Sunday. I call it Sunday at 7. Well, that's what I am generally part of. And then I also have the other streams during the week as they come up. So uh, have there been uh, commercial uh, sessions also done uh, at the studio during this time? Commercial? Um, I, I mean, I heard so many great things said earlier about, like, how do you pay the musicians? And yes, I, um, if that's what you're referring to. Yeah, well... I, um, I was saying yes and amen to, um, I can't remember if it was Henry who was talking about like how do you monetize that and pay, and his numbers were exactly what mine were to start. I'd say please if you can contribute five bucks, this is the only way we get paid. And I keep it intimate, like I want it to feel like it's a, hit, it's a jazz gig and we hit it and quit it. You just see the thing and it goes away. So I actually don't keep it up generally online. We do this, it's a live gig, if you can make it, great. And they pay in advance and we send them the link. And if people have a problem, like they, oh, I didn't get the link, I'll, I'll make sure that it's published so that they can see it. But in general, I want it to feel like that live gig that they used to experience only, unfortunately, through their laptop or, you know. Well, a lot of people watch on a large screen system, which I appreciate. I was, I was really thinking when I said commercial productions, whether record labels were uh, also using you during this time. Yeah, I was wondering about that word. Um, no. Um, I have um, done some recording um, projects that ended up being um, right around the weekend of a live stream. So I streamed, I ended up streaming those sessions, about three of them, including George Colligan and let's see, there's Sha Wei Wu and there's um, somebody else. So we did a session. We might have recorded for two or three days or, you know, I recorded their project because I do engineering as well as playing. And then um, on Sunday, we live streamed and we recorded it. And that may or may not actually be what they do for their final CD or whatever they decide to put it out on. But there's, I have no no stream coming in from any Blue Note. Is there a Blue Note record anymore? Uh, you know, <laughs> you know. Oh anyway. yes, and in fact, they have several uh, nominations in our jazz uh, awards that have just uh, been released. Yeah. So yes. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> I've got, I've been, it, you know, I was lucky right before this all hit, I was in New York at Rudy Van Gelder Studio with Charles McPherson, and I was there, and I pro helped produce it, and I mixed it, I mastered, it, I got, and then bam, everything closed down right after that, and there's been no like, it's not nearly the same since then. Hmm. Well, Portland is going to open up again, like every place else, I think. Uh, Mario, are you still here? I'm yes, not... yes, I'm here. Hi. Get in, a, get in on this discussion, too, please. Yes. Okay. Um, I want to start with uh, what happened today. We actually, uh, I'm with Jazz in the Neighborhood. I'm a trumpet player also, but I, I must say most of my energy in the last year has been going into my organization, um, a nonprofit. Um, started in the in Bay Area. Area. In the uh, Bay Area. In the Bay Area. Um, so today we made a presentation to a uh, San Francisco supervisor, a uh, proposal which um, uh, there's been a lot of money uh, going back out in the community, and as it should be, 
but it's not it's not touching most of the people that we serve, uh, the jazz musicians and uh, organizations. So um, I fe I thought that instead of uh, just giving grants out, which we did, we did thirty thousand dollars of relief aid grant right right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, but instead of doing that, that we would get try to get the the city to um, pay money to the venues. But with an attachment, with a with a clause in it that says, this money is to be used to hire musicians and pay them, and so um, so in other words, uh, money going out would not only get to musicians, but it would also invigorate the the neighborhood and the community, and um, it's it was received very well today. We're we're on on step two to get to the to the money people. Um, but but you know I, I I saw a lot of articles about um, the arts has to lead the way and that's going to bring tourists back and all of that which is all true um, and now I think we've tapped into a way uh, which we've been trying for eight years to get guaranteed fair wages to jazz musicians we don't allow tip jars at our gigs we um, we are always looking for funding and it, it it's not going to happen I don't believe until until there's some kind of government uh, um, regular subsidizing of the arts um, and, the, and that that money comes through and gets gets back to musicians. So um, that's pretty exciting for us today. Um, and I'll keep you posted as what where it goes from here. Um, I think it's a model that could work in any city and I'm happy to share any of that stuff um, with you. Um, the other stuff that we did, one of the first things we did was we, we created a safe place to play. Um, we took a factory uh, Drescher Ensemble, Paul Drescher Ensemble in West Oakland, and we created, um, it's like, a, it's like a, a warehouse, and it's a big space. We put extra ventilation in. We got uh, uh, some booths and separation. Um, so, and then all the, all the jazz players could sign up for a three-hour uh, slot uh, one day a week just to come in and play. It was free, free for them. We paid Drescher the, the rental um, and we encouraged everybody to come in, uh, you know, call someone up that you want to play with and just come in and play. Um, and a, a lot of people who I'm sure you all recognize uh, showed up, especially when they started getting nervous about playing with people again. Um, so they came in and, and started playing and that's been going on weekly since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, then we created we created a, a teaching directory, artist teaching directory. Uh, we put a minimum salary of $80 an hour on it. Um, and we put it out to the public so that people could pick up more more money uh, through teaching. Um, we did- um, Did you get takers for that? Did you, get that? Many, did you get many takers on that? Yeah, it, it, it helped and it also established uh, um, some kind of standard. Uh, we have a standard of 150 bucks uh, per musician for for gigs, and now we've established this $80 rate for teaching. Um, I think uh, you know the union's been um, been asleep since about 1980 when it comes to jazz players, or maybe before that. Uh, but anyhow, so the Independent Musicians Alliance, which is a group uh, that I formed with Eric Whittington at Bird and Beckett, who does a lot of music in the Bay Area. Uh, we put that together, and that's an advocacy group, and we're going to continue working stuff with that group. Um, we donated money to Angela Wellman's wonderful Oakland Public Conservatory in Oakland um, and helped pay her teachers to do one-on-one -on -one, uh, teaching with with their students. Um, so we kept our, our hand in the emerging artist uh, category with, with education. Um, I so think, much great, yeah. I think that's most of it. <laughs> so much great work. I mean, everybody. I I'm, I, I want to get you know to um, uh, Gerald uh, Dunn from uh, Kansas City, Mary uh, MJ from Montana, and um, who am I missing here? I know there's some people. Uh, oh yes, John Demetrio, um, and uh, we'll get. Her being on this too, although doesn't exactly um, uh, match the theme that I had in mind for this. I was going to ask people whether uh, you, Rob, uh, Gerald, uh, who are in 
and MJ who are in places that aren't necessarily thought of as having uh, active jazz scenes, although Kansas City has always been there. Um, whether you've suffered during the pandemic from uh, having less resources or whether you've actually been able to expand your reach uh, because there's been so much online activity. Has that helped? So um, I'm sorry, maybe I'll throw that to you first, Gerald. Can you uh, respond to that? Sure, um, Howard, thank you so much. And, and as I've heard so many other people say that we were really thankful for being a part of such uh, an esteemed group of people. And you never know who all else is this committed to this music. Uh, it's sort of like a thankless effort. You don't walk around hoping to just have people just thank you for everything that you do because you do it for other reasons. But it's great to be a part of a group that you know uh, that understands what goes into uh, promoting the music, uh, creating venues for artists and things like that. So I really thank you guys for being a part of it. I'd say the biggest partnership for us, um, of course, it, it, it was we were impacted. The biggest partnership for us was uh, the local musicians um, who were, seemed to be more inspired than anyone else. Um, I think in this, whenever you're hearing the, the bad stories or the sad stories, musicians are constantly coming up with new ideas, new ways to um, 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 sing, uh, express, and, and make their voices heard. And I think the technology, uh, I really I, I really relish in the idea that, yeah, it was a reset, it was shut down, but uh, it, it goes to show the resilience of people who really, really love what they do. It's not a job, you know, it's, 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 it's a love of what you do. And uh, some of the other partnerships that we had, though, but I, I can't go any further without thanking uh, our, our new director, uh, executive director, Rashida Phillips, who came on a year ago and also our board that's really supportive. The uh, city of Kansas City um, came out uh, in support of what we were doing. There was another group called the Jazz District Renaissance Corporation um, that was headed up by uh, Congressman Cleaver. He came out with a program over uh, this time period called Jamdemic, where we brought in um, artists of all genres, jazz, blues, uh, folk, uh, R&B, it, it just all of it. And it, it was really just to, it was like a, um, uh, how would you say, um, it was like a tribal meeting, I would say, or just when people are all coming together, you get a chance to uh, uh, fuse the different styles together, different musicians working together. But in this uh, opportunity that was created, we were able to stream performances. Um, on, and I think we did over 60 shows there. Uh, we did streaming shows here at the uh, Jazz Museum as well. But uh, other people that came on board for us was like Truman Medical Center, who helped us uh, set up a program for um, uh, providing pro produce for jazz musicians through their, their wellness center. Um, also an opportunity for musicians to go in and get medical records established. Because you know, a lot of times uh, cats travel all the time and you have a little pain and you're like, well, I'll just take a Tylenol and we'll go on. And it and a lot of times they just don't check in until you're about to check out. And then uh, you have no choice. So Truman Medical Center helped out a, a great deal. The lo local radio stations really kicked in and, and helped to really um, get this music out that these guys were creating over this time. We also did a Charlie Parker, um, I don't want to say a contest, but it was like a composer's forum where we picked um, um, three top uh, winners of that particular contest. And that tend to, that tend to uh, get a lot of creative juices flowing. And uh, I just, you know, I just really can't. And another person that I can't go on without uh, mentioning as well is Bobby Watson, who was a hero uh, for us in helping to um, uh, keep people motivated, um, his students that he taught uh, who are out on the scene right now, they were very motivating. And another young guy, Logan Richardson, who is originally from Kansas City, who uh, called up and said, hey man, we're doing something really cool. You should look into this as well. And it was uh, a program that they were calling uh, Culture Folk. 
and they had started streaming musicians um, all over uh, the world through that program. And it was it had a paywall as well. So some of these guys are really figuring out how to maneuver and manipulate these uh, different social media pages or create their own sites to uh, monetize uh, these uh, programs as well. And I think that's real promising because as I've heard other people mention mm -hmm. that you've got to find a way to sustain yourself uh, by doing this. It, you'd like to do it and, and give it to people, they receive it and you see the reactions of, of people, but there's a value that has to be placed on this. And uh, I think jazz is probably one of the few art forms that when you're having a conversation about it, uh, it's sort of like, uh, I don't know, wow, that's fun. <laughs> you're a jazz musician. Uh, it's, it's, we're seeing, uh, like you've heard a lot of people say, they're the first to be fired <laughs> and the last to be called. Uh, and when you're talking to an electrician or a plumber, they have their fees that are set. Yeah. And uh, if you want your, uh, uh, your, your, your water to be fixed, that plumber comes in, he, make, he charges you, and you figure out how much you need to pay for it. That's I'm right. not saying that the arts should be that strict about it, but I think a lot of times we have to look at how we market uh, our, 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 uh, our content, our, ourselves, and, and make sure that you're saying the right things and, and uh, you're placing yourselves in the right uh, positions so that people understand that they're not paying to see you. They're actually uh, actually uh, supporting an experience. And um, I could go on and on and on, but- um, um, I can't I let you. <laughs> I can't let you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. I, I No, you, all the points you're making are good. I'm gonna talk to Rob Dixon, we're gonna talk to Herb Scott, and then I'm gonna ask um, my friends, uh, John Swed and uh, Michael Jackson, to uh, say something brilliant about what they've heard all afternoon. What um, about MJ? We haven't heard from MJ. Oh, I'm sorry, MJ, you're on this. Yes, I'm sorry, my uh, fault. So um, let's hear about Montana first and then Rob, get to you, okay? Sorry. MJ, you know, nobody thinks there's jazz in Montana. I mean, I had this discussion with uh, Jack uh, Walrath, I think a few years ago. Tell, tell me, how have you guys, you have a strong group, but it seems like a small chord. Is that true? Yeah. I, I'm going to tell you that uh, jazz saved my life. And every contemporary player who lives in Montana that I talk to has told me the same thing. The, the, the quality of information, intellect, history, um, information about uh, social injustice, uh, racism, all of that information came to young white people in Montana through jazz. And that is not to say that there weren't any people of color in, in Montana or that there aren't now, but my, in my generation, this is where that information came from. And Jack, Jack is a friend of mine, uh, so many players uh, were touched by jazz through the airwaves. Uh, it's hard to describe. When I was growing up, there were less than a million people in the whole of Montana. Montana is a huge state and it has its own uh, history of racism. And people take in this information and use it creatively. I have, uh, I just finished, I just had a conversation with a friend of mine who lives. Um, in Browning uh, on the Blackfeet Nation. And we had a conversation about her cousin who I met many years ago, who was an avid jazz fan. Her, her, uh, was her brother did some arranging for Jimmy Rolls in LA and she, she was Blackfeet. She came, sought us out. We played together. We worked together. Uh, there's a, there's a ton of these stories that are tentacles to intelligence and and the stories of people who were so, uh, I'm sorry, this is emotional for me because. Understandable. There's just so much that we would not have if it hadn't been for this music and for these brilliant people who reached out to us th through 
recordings that someone would slip in your door if you were a kid or or over, uh, Les Bowen coming from Salt Lake City late at night and really dating myself, but what the <laughs> hell, you know? And, and, and so it, uh, yes, it lives here. And, and I, you know, Jack Walworth is one of them. Jim Rotundi is another. Uh, we've had people from all over the world come to Montana and then we followed them out back into the larger world and learned and learned and then we came back to montana because this is the fire we had to tend the fire here and i am grateful for all of you because every work every bit of work that gets done on the national level that grows this art form that sustains this art form is vital to us i live in one of the reddest states in the country and there's, there's so much need for this heart and soul here. So uh, I have not been very active. I'm, I'm just a musician. Uh, I, I call my, I'm a perennial pop-up producer because nothing gets sustained here. But, you know, I, I'll go on as long as I possibly can. We're going to do the Montana Artists Refuge again because we had some really brilliant people from New York that came here and played all over the state. We had, <laughs> we had a lot of fun and that's what we base everything we do on fun and, uh, and, and this brilliant music that we're all exploring together. So I, I appreciate the being called a hero. I'm not a jazz hero. I'm a trombone player. <laughs> <laughs> that <will> count. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what can I say? But you guys are all wonderful, and thank you so much for all the information that you, uh, I mean, I'm taking notes. I, I'm, I didn't mean to speak very much. I, I was mostly here to listen. But Oh, no, I, no. You're going to be part of the uh, coterie from here on out. That's not, a, not an issue. You've been an important uh, keystone there, obviously, and we should be trying to bring you into uh, uh, a more effective network. Uh, Rob, uh, uh, you've been so patient, and I know that there's a lot going on. Uh, in Indy also. So uh, talk about what you've done. Some of it has been pretty quiet that, you know, you haven't been talking it up as far as I know, but uh, you've been very active, please. Yeah, um, and, th and thank you for having uh, me on this. I'm, to, I'm honored to talk among this esteemed panel and these jazz heroes. Um, I would be remiss though. I just wanted to give a shout out to Gerald Dunn because I don't know if he knows this, but he knows me from 1997 when he left Illinois Jaquette's band to go back to Kansas City. I took his spot in Illinois. <laughs> band. I took your your spot, and then I moved. That was my first gig when I went overseas. So, yeah, I just knew that you had taken a big position. Some, you know, they say he got a big gig in Kansas City, so he left New York. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I appreciate all the work you're doing there. So I, I you know, as a, I'm a saxophonist, but I work as an artistic director for Indie Jazz Fest, and um, well, we did we did focus on local musicians. Um, we created the Indie Musicians Relief Fund, and our initial goal was like fifty thousand dollars, and we ended up raising a hundred thousand dollars. So we just kind of um, put uh, relief grants out to people that were professional musicians. You didn't have to be just a jazz musician or we said our, our blues musician. We expanded if you worked as a professional musician. Um, the other thing that we did, we commissioned a, a, a number of jazz musicians to write pieces. And if you guys uh, all go to indiejazzfest.net, you can see it, it's still up there. The commission works. Um, we learned about, you know, virtual programming. So that is something that we're gonna use and uh, from here on out. Um, it serves well to archive the jazz performances as, as as well as it kind of can protect people in this this in COVID environment. Um, but um, I'm just going to leave it there because I know there's people that want to talk, and I'm 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 going to hop back on. But I'm going to hop off because I actually am headed to a gig. I'm going to Cincinnati Cafe Vivace. I'll be there at seven o'clock tonight. So <laughs> <laughs> if you guys want to live stream, it's on Facebook. Uh, you can see me there. Um, I'm going to hop back on in a second, but I'm just going to pass it over to, back to you, Howard. And thank you again. Thank you. And uh, right. thanks, Rob. All right. Uh, Herb, you're going to get the last word here, except for the journalists and whatever they have to say. 
But uh, you've heard a lot about all this activity going on. And Aaron earlier had uh, let us in on all the activity that you guys have been doing. Um, I, I guess I want to come to the idea that he brought up earlier and that also Mario mentioned about um, public funding and uh, uh, legislation of some sort that really could uh, establish uh, or help establish working uh, payment, uh, you know, uh, viable compensation for musicians and artists. That sounds like something that you guys have been in the forefront of, of trying to push. Is that so? I think you've got to unmute. Yes, definitely. We, we kicked off the year, the, the beginning of the pandemic, um, organizing a phone call that uh, w would basically, uh, that comprised uh, essentially at that point that we call the DC jazz stakeholders to examine what the relief efforts were going to look like uh, amongst the scene so that there wasn't too much overlap or musicians were missing out on available funding or uh, a support in that way. And um, we were, as, as Aaron mentioned, we were the first to jump out there to offer um, uh, micro grants to uh, two rounds of micro grants to DC based jazz musicians. Um, and it was kind of, you know, my position. I, I'm the founder of the Capitol Hill Jazz Foundation. And it's always been my position. I'm a native Washingtonian that um, DC jazz musicians and, the, and the, the surrounding musicians need as much support uh, in terms of grant funding. One of the reasons why I started the foundation was that when jazz musicians were applying for grants in Washington, DC, they often had to compete against the other performing arts uh, groups and then separately uh, against the other music genre art forms. And I thought that jazz deserved its own kind of space to, um, to be recognized and supported in that way. And so our efforts for the past five years um, have involved us engaging the city council on various issues to not only maintain the, uh, the, the support for the, the nonprofit sector of jazz or music and arts and culture in Washington, D.C. through the Commission on the Arts and Humanities, but also the for-profit sector with the Office of Cable Television, Film and Music and Entertainment to ensure that there's other um, performance opportunities and other grants for individuals uh, and, and, and organizations as well. And so throughout the year, um, that call shifted to more of an advocacy kind of related call where we, uh, you know, the foundation to basically kind of make things very, very clear as I talk here is very focused on three kind of segments, which are, which are the music community, which are musicians, venues, and music education programs. And so that's kind of how we separate and delineate where we're going to focus our efforts. And so we began with the musicians, then we realized quickly thereafter that we, venues, music venues, we wanted to preserve them that when we came on the, came out on the other side of this um, pandemic and, and things were reopened, that we would be essentially be able to reopen back to a scene. And so we helped draft a piece of legislation entitled the Music Venue Relief Act. Um, and we really pushed the mayor of Washington to really observe that and try to, to, to get some support behind that. Thankfully, that particular bill was not um, introduced. However, there was a, a kind of an overall kind of um, uh, a bill that, that supported the gig workers in Washington, D.C. And so there were musicians um, and some venues that were able to benefit from that. Prior to the pandemic, we were successful at, at helping to draft the um, performing, what was it, performing Arts Promotion uh, Amendment of 2019, which provided, which provides up to $15,000 in a property tax rebate for small music venues here in Washington, D.C. And so we are, we are very mm -hmm. grateful that there have been a few venues in D.C. that have taken advantage of that um, that provision and have actually received their money. Um, another thing that we, you know, Aaron mentioned is the uh, uh, the Jazz Caucus, our national efforts to, um, to preserve jazz, promote jazz uh, nationally. And we, we're, we're happy to mention that Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, who uh, we're still waiting for the certification, the recertification of that caucus. Um, but she did reintroduce the, uh, the jazz preservation bill, which um, I'm going to put in the uh, YouTube chat here. Uh, it's HR 139. It's the new bill reintroduced into this Congress <clears throat> that um, 
calls for the preservation of, of jazz institutions and things. For those of you that are familiar with HR 57, which was the original kind of jazz preservation bill into uh, back in the day. Do you feel like these, these pieces of legislation have a decent chance of passing? Is the, uh, is the government, uh, you know, open to the arts now, do you think, because of the pandemic and the resilience that we've shown? Well, this is just a bill. This is just a resolution uh, we're right. just looking to get support for. And, um, you know, one thing that we acknowledge, and, uh, you know, the, the, um, the I, I can't remember her name at this this moment, the, the lady from Montana <clears throat> talked about MJ. Montana being MJ, yes. Um, but, you know, jazz, and we all know this, and music, and just in general, is, is a bipartisan issue. Um, so, and, you know, part of the effort of getting support around any jazz related issues or music related issues is one identifying the 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 uniqueness of jazz versus the other music caucuses out there and getting getting support from um members to join that caucus from both sides of the aisle so um as we move through this congress we don't know i mean unfortunately our, our co-chair well fortunately i don't know how you depends on how you look at it um Doug Collins from Georgia no longer uh, has that seat in Georgia. But when that caucus was introduced, it was really nominal to see that someone, these completely polar opposite members of Congress, Sheila Jackson Lee and uh, Doug Collins, were co-chairing a jazz caucus in, in Congress. So we're continually looking at other ways that we can move that caucus along. Sheila Jackson Lee's office um, that you know is uh, is has been very supportive of us, but there's been a lot of turnover within her ranks, and so we're we're just kind of continuing to keep abreast of that um, that thing. You know, the other side of issues that we we fo focus we focus on here in Washington D.C. is just um, making sure that the not only that the council recognizes the beauty of the music, but that there's not efforts to thwart the performances of music. And so, two years ago, there was a bill introduced called the Amplified Noise Amendment that would call for the fine and arrest of musicians who perform too loudly on oh, the street. No. Oh, yes. no. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was the original bill called for a $600 fine of, uh, <laughs> of, of, of performers and a confiscation of the noise making device oh, and, no. poss and possibly 10 days in jail. And Aye. so <laughs> we, uh, we advocated very, 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 very aggressively against that bill and it was rescinded, but there were efforts to reintroduce that bill um, during the pandemic, because you know musicians were were, were looking to, without anywhere to play, cats go outside and play in the park and you know different things. And so, we've been working on um, in, in other ways instead of uh, policing over policing the musicians, looking at ways to designate those particular problem areas as arts arts areas and arts um, districts and that, that sort of thing. So we've worked on another piece of a legislation that is being introduced called harmonious living, which is a bunch of different elements of that. But part of it, part of that is basically kind of um, an agreement between developers and residents that move uh, and, and, and live in, in a uh, known historic entertainment district that this is, it's kind of like a, a treaty in a, in a sense that you, you will um, acknowledge that this, this space has been historically designated as a, entertainment commercial space and that that's where you're living now also a provision for those developers or property managers or whatever that want to um, insulate their um, their spaces so that they can um, they would receive a rebate uh, in order to, to, to shield themselves from the, the, the music there so wow. we're kind of working on both ends of that um, that issue there. The other thing that I've been trying to, to, to inspire, I mean, well, and the, the other element that we've been kind of rallying musicians around is that, um, you know, once the election happened, we had a save the, uh, it was hashtag save DC music venues uh, effort where we had a citywide concert. We, we, had, we looked for as many different groups, individuals, bands to perform at different spots all throughout Washington, DC to, to send the message to the mayor that we need support to save our DC music venues. And then on the election day, we had our musicians perform at polling stations to remind voters that they should keep in mind uh, to vote for candidates that support the arts, jazz, and, and culture. Um, and that was our kind of swing the vote campaign. And we did that 
we had a performance at the Supreme Court as well. So we've done a lot of nominal things, a lot of kind of, uh, uh, you know, in addition to the relief and, and, the, and the bills, we've done things to kind of rally the musicians to kind of keep the spirit up. Um, we're currently celebrating a Jazz Appreciation Month with a bunch of daily things. And, um, and I personally want to say I, I'm really uh, uh, grateful and honored to be uh, included upon, uh, with this, this stellar group of people. I didn't even know I was nominated. So it was, the whole thing's a shock to me, I'm, you know, but uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thanks, Herb. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, this has been an incredible uh, group of people talking about some great stuff. But let me ask my friend John Swed. John, are you there? John, unmute yourself. There we go. And, All right. Well, have, could you have any takeaways from the discussions you've been listening to? It's the most encouraging news I heard. By the way, I'm sorry I'm late. I got a good excuse. But I caught the drift. I mean, um, I forget I forget how far this music reaches. Um, you know, I, I was born in a town that had, I think, uh, 1,900 people in it. At least three people in that town became famous musicians. And against all odds, I remember one of them asked, um, how did you find this music? It went on the radio. He said they were in a um, drugstore. They saw these records for sale. It was the days when things could happen. They said they were all white with black print on them. And it said, you never heard such sounds in your life. And they bought them. I said, whoa, you bought ESP records? So they thought it was extra sensory perception, you know. And <laughs> anyway, they became serious people, <laughs> totally in isolation. So. You hear people this active in so many ways. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, I, I try to stay active um, um, myself. I mean, I've done five five Zoom things about Billy Holiday, who's you may know is now a jazz hero in herself. And I turned down to because it was getting too dense. See, I did three programs with um, Town Hall. It's been shut down in New York because they have all this history of all kinds of people playing there, and they've been bringing it back to people on, on, online, saying, look, this is what we had we want to bring back. Um, what else? Oh, I'm doing one about Sun Rolf through Paris, of all places, where suddenly Paris has just woke up about Sun Ra a little late, I guess, and um, the people coming in from the seven countries to do that sort of thing. So that's oh. my, my part of this. Um, you know, our esteemed uh, Philadelphia hero, Mr. Tacumba, knows the scene here better than I do. So I haven't been here that long. But well, I do remember this, though. An old friend of mine, Byron Blankister, must have missed for many years. He was arrested for playing his piccolo too loud near a subway. I mean, <laughs> right. You know? yep, that's right. Yep. <laughs> but if I, I wasn't here at the time, we all wrote yep. letters. <clears throat> if I remember, I may have this wrong, but is it true that the, the cop who arrested him got arrested for not showing up. <laughs> I, I don't remember. I don't remember that. But he Bayard himself. He was, you know, always playing outside. You know, right. him, him and Odin Pope both. They were, you know, known for doing that. You know, so all the problems that I'm sure that he had was justified. <laughs> <laughs> the piccolo, you know. I know. I know. <laughs> Thank you, John Swed. Uh, biographer of uh, Billy Holiday, of Alan Lomax, of Sun Ra, Miles Davis uh, in Philadelphia, and wrote the little uh, bio up of Jamal Adin uh, Takuma for the Philadelphia Jazz Hero. Okay, Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson, turn up, unmute yourself and say something. I know you're never at a loss for words, so I want to hear what you think of this conversation you've been listening to all afternoon. Can you hear me? Certainly can. Oh, well, all right. Well, it's it's absolutely wonderful to see all these faces. May I mention uh, it's great to see so many faces of colour since uh, you guys, you know, invented the bloody stuff. And um, the thing is also, uh, Demetra Taylor, blues musician from Chicago, mentioned uh, a festival at the, uh, the, uh, the, the Logan Centre a few years ago that, you know, a lot of black musicians weren't involved in the blues because they'd moved on and that black musicians have a tendency to create new forms and then we kind of reject the old ones or move on. So for me personally, it's great to see so many black faces involved structurally 
uh, as game changers and helpers within the music that you know you created really so that's 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 something i want to bring up if i'm if i'm permitted to um yeah it's just wonderful um a lot quite a few of you i don't know um just trying to keep track of some names um you know it's interesting how in the provinces things have opened up quicker in certain places for example i went on a kind of reconnaissance back in before i went to detroit and uh, i think it's wendell who mentioned cliff bells i happened to be there for the reopening of cliff, cliff bells uh night and james carter showed up and it was a wonderful moment the jazz kitchen uh, of course rob i think has left has been open for quite a while and you know doing a lot of music it's only just happening in chicago um with yeah. Seagull's showcase opening and gemelo's green mill and uh there's uh what do you want me to say howard with regard to the, <laughs> i mean i that's fine. That's fine, Michael. I just thought you'd sat here and you've listened. You've been part of the conversation. Well, Michael is a brilliant writer, photographer, uh, uh, printmaker, uh, very good saxophonist, and a uh, JJ member who wrote the bio of um, our uh, Chicago jazz hero, Marguerite Horberg. So, um, what well, if I say, Howard, uh, personally, I have found it very interesting the, the pandemic. I have actually made a fantastic record myself uh, ah. based on old recordings that I actually have neglected. But because of the dead time, I went back and looked at it. I've recorded on my kitchen table some great musicians. I have 18 musicians involved in this project. It's fantastic. That also people, I've sold uh, more work during the pandemic. People who are going nuts in their house. I have found that I... I love my house more in spite of being <laughs> imprisoned here for a year. You know, people are like, I want the stuff on the wall that represents what I'm into. So I've sold photos to people who never, musicians who don't traditionally buy pictures of themselves or musicians, they don't have the budget for it. They bought, you know, I just sold six pieces to a, a piano player in London, you know. Um, so that's been very interesting how, how that kind of paradigm shifted. Also, Chicago has been interesting. There's been a lot of great experiments. The Hyde Park Jazz Festival was very interesting. The way they, a couple of things, they had gigs that were non-announced, so people didn't cluster. They didn't know what was going on, really. But then they, so it was distributed amongst a lot of gigs. I thought that was brilliant. They also did very professional level video recording, but they only made it... Uh, for subscribers and streamers at the time. It wasn't archived. So that then people, I don't know what the metrics are on that, but whether people actually contributed. I think that I heard that the stuff that Gemelo was doing at the mill with Kurt Elling and stuff was actually, obviously Kurt's a big name. They were bringing quite a lot Kurt of, you know, 15 bucks. They were hitting those 15 bucks and um, it was really doing something. So musicians in Chicago, for example, when it all started, were doing hilarious things. There was a saxophone player, Dan Nicholson, I remember, who went into his basement to do the washing, right? And he put the washing machine on and he did windmills of your mind. And he he, <laughs> he had all like 15 versions of himself and an arrangement, which is genius. <laughs> but, you know, you guys, um, you know, you, you guys are, are incredible. I mean, Marguerite obviously is an old friend of mine. She's been doing stuff for so many years. And what I love about Marguerite, and I've only just learned that she traveled the world. She went on a, in a, a car from Iran to Paris or something. Yeah, and Michael, Michael, Michael. Well, that's relevant. You're never, you're never at a loss for words. But we are at the two-hour mark, and I think that this has been a great conversation. I really appreciate everybody stand, staying in it and, and listening and, like, contributing to uh, uh, partake of how we are a community in this sense. So thanks everybody. Thanks very much to uh, Brett Premack, the jazz video guy. To, Thank you. Uh, MJ Thank you Williams, Thank Gregory you. Bell, uh, Jose Masso, uh, Louise Richards, Nancy Ochenschlager, uh, Wendell Harrison, Jamaladeen Takuma, uh, Gerald Dunn, John Sweat, Henry Wong, Greer Smith, Sue Ross, Susan Brink, Mariano Guarneri, uh, uh, Herb Scott, 
Norman Vickers, Phil Byther, Aaron Myers, um, uh, uh, Gail Boyd. Uh, I don't think I probably missed somebody, but you get the impression. I'm grateful to all of you for being a part of these uh, community of jazz uh, heroes and of, of people who are really helping to keep this music going. So thanks very much. On behalf of the Jazz Journalists Association, I'm Howard Mandel, uh, Susan Brink, our associate producer on The Heroes. Thanks, Brett Premack. And uh, let's keep making music and, and listening to it, okay? That's All the right. plan. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Take care. All right.